Good morning, good morning. I am excited today to be with my mate Helen Nagel Smith because we thought we would jump onto the um, camera today. We have announced that we're going to do a workshop about synesthesia um, and cross sensory perception of essential oils. And both of us have been inundated by, by people saying this sounds really interesting, but what synesthesia? So we thought, right, we'll get into that on a video. So we don't have to go into it too much on the workshop. Helen, thanks for doing this today. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for, for talking about it, because this is something that doesn't very often get talked about. I think um, people are quite intrigued by synesthesia, aren't they? I thought it was really fascinating, it actually. Well, we kind of almost took over the conversation at the Aroma Trust Summit, because as soon as people seized on it, they were like, that's fascinating. Why don't you tell people your thoughts about what it is? So I so synesthesia is really about a union of senses. So that can be very different in different people. It can present very, very differently. So we're talking about the joining up between something like taste and um, words, for example. So people tasting a name, tasting a word. Um, it's the joining up of things like um, color and letters or numbers, for example. It's the joining up of hearing something and seeing something visual. So it's a joining of any of our five senses. And it's a little bit like overactivation, if you like, in the brain. So for most people, this is really, really helpful because actually what it helps people do very often, there's research around it that shows that it helps people with memory and things like that, but also has some other facets to it, which are a little bit unusual. So sometimes people see clusters of things. So um, when you have um, synesthesia and you have clusters, what you do is you have um, something typical would be the most common, let's say the most common is seeing um, letters uh, in colour. Yeah. So um, so when you said to me, Liz, what's what's like the colour of my name? I was like, well, not really anything too exciting. Can I just to... tell you how offended I am that I've got a Bilal <laughs> name? <laughs> really sorry. <laughs> you explain to be explain it to people because I think it's so funny that I've got a Bilal name now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really beautiful swirling colours and I would say you know some people's names are blends of swirling colours and and this case what's my name and I'm like well I don't really get the big thing but it's kind of like blue because Ellie's blue <laughs> and you're very upset weren't you and very kind of offended by I that. think it should be gold with purple <laughs> flecks coming through it and then angel dust coming off it and a little bit of sparkle maybe yeah 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 <laughs> And smelling of roses, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but but so I will make you light of it now. So so explain how you do see words as colours. And also, interestingly, that your mum sees them differently. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I see um, certain letters. I should say not all letters. So theoretically, I think I should probably be called a partial um synesthetes really um so i see letters as a particular color um and that's always been the same so the color doesn't really change it's it's stationary so we know from um, research that's been done on this that this forms early on in the child's perception and it stays the same throughout the life so if i see like i said to you before h is red for me if I see H as red at the age of two or four or 10, it's the same as it is now. It hasn't changed. Um, however, my my mum, because normally there's a hereditary element to this as well, my mum will see H as a different colour. So I remember having a conversation, and my sister will as well. So I remember having a conversation with the three of us, and we're going, well, this letter is this colour, or this name is a, a combination of these colours. And the other person would go, no, it's not, it's this. Because that's your own reality, right? Because that's what yeah. you see. That's yeah. that's kind of how you've done it. So I remember that conversation with them, but I don't ever remember having that conversation with anybody else. So I didn't even have... Um, a word for it or a name for it. It was only after I wrote my first book and I talked about experiencing oils as colours or swirls of colours or something like that. And one of my clients came in to see me and he said, oh, he said, um, so he said you're, you're a, a synesthete. And I find it really hard to say, as you can tell. Um, and I was sitting there thinking, I don't know what that word is. 
How What's rude. What's so rude? What's How so rude? rude? I'm a perfectly nice person. <laughs> I said to him, oh, sorry, sorry, what was that? <laughs> well, you, you know, you give that, that moment to yourself just to think about what you've heard and do you understand what's being said and do I need to ask for clarification? He said, when you talked in your book about how you seek colours with things, I didn't actually know there was a name for it. I'd just grown yeah. up with it. Same, same. And I was really taken aback when Gergley said, oh, you're like PS. And I went, am I? What? What did you say? And he said, you're like PS. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he went, there's a really famous perfumer who, who hears scents as musical notes. And I was like, somebody else does that. And actually, so, and, and, um, Lots of people have come to me now and said, I'm like that, like Francis Bartlett. And, and I think what's lovely is real deep friendships have come from this sameness for me, yes. you know, yes. because otherwise you feel odd, don't you? You do, you do. And I think I said to you before, you know, I when I grew up, I remember saying to a couple of people, do you see things as certain colours? I mean, this is the most common one, right? When you see things as certain colours. no. And then you realise quite quickly, shut up about that. Because shut actually, up, exactly. Yeah. And so I can remember being about 14, and I've written about this in one of my books, can't remember, maybe Mind, Body, Spirit, can't remember. But I can remember always feeling like an outsider at school. I always was different. And, it, and sometimes it was okay, sometimes it wasn't. But one particular day, I can remember thinking, well, that grass is green, but do they know what green looks like? Are they seeing the same green as me? And I really was like, I was totally unaware of the conversation that was going on alongside me. And yet I remember this thought process really. And I was thinking, I really want to ask them what colour they see the, the grass as, but they won't be able to tell me either. And the more I thought about it, the further away I felt from these friends and the more isolated I felt. And by the time I got home, I was really quite depressed by this thing of I'm so different that I can't even say those thoughts to people. Yeah, absolutely. And years ago as well, I think, interestingly, how would we have viewed this years ago? So now I think very much we 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 look at how the brain works in a very different way, don't we, right? We, we understand a lot more about, um, you know, if you look at the conversations now around neurodiversity, we, we're understanding more and more about the brain sort of year by year by year, and there's more and more research. So now I think it's perceived as well, actually, this is just, you know, this is something interesting that's happening. We're getting um, this multi-sensory experience. Um, it's more common than we thought it was. You know, if you look at the old research papers, it's like, oh, you know, one in 2000. Well, now it's more likely to be thought to be, you know, three or four people in a hundred. So we're realizing a lot more about it and we're understanding actually how it can be really beneficial. But I also think for individuals, because we don't talk about, how I experience a sound or a word or in, in we don't have that much language around it do we mm -hmm. then it can feel a bit odd because suddenly your best friend or somebody else you're talking to at school hasn't got a clue what you're talking about and actually there are we can go into this in the workshop there are cognitive Im implications for children um you know who are, who are learning as well um when they're having this kind of because for some people it can be a real onslaught of the senses so it can have mm -hmm. really positive impacts you know, it can be very creative. You tend to find people that have it are in more creative roles. You know, there's, um, there's a lot of singers aren't there and composers. And, and so it can be used in a really useful way, but actually it can be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit um, tricky as well for some people who have it in, in quite um, a profound way. Um, and, and lots of people have more than one type as well. So yeah, yeah. That um, then has a big I remember that. I remember reading and you saying actually Kanye West has several doesn't he of diff uh, different layers of yeah. it yeah and yeah. it must it must feel very overwhelming and I, I was thinking about what you and I were talking about the other day about the impacts on people at school mm -hmm. of not really absorbing that and I, I was thinking well, actually thinking about it well, there was a layer where it was accommodated in my school I can remember when we studied for our 16 pluses, which is like oh, GCSEs now. I think it was only two years in the whole history of the world that did the same exams with me. But we were told you must revise on yellow paper. Right. Um, and we were all given these yellow pads and told that 
the it, that it would help positivity and that the brain would remember more with yellow so that's not that dissimilar to what we when we smell lemon mm. that kind of uplift as well you know the the level yeah. was the same really yeah and the clarity of thought that goes with smelling level as uh, yeah smelling lemon as well yeah that kind of that you know focus in yeah and, yeah. The, and i think on that level well, if we take this like out of the abstract more into essential oils, if we can, then if you anybody who smells lemon, I think, would close their eyes and see yellow. Yeah. yeah. Maybe because of a cultural association, because you think, oh, that's lemon. And, uh, but also I think that it has a colour. The smell yeah. has a colour. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that to some extent you can say we've all got the ability. It's just that we don't hone it or we don't um focus on it that much you know we live in a very um very visual and very auditory world don't we yeah so other senses or exploring something that's a little bit more unusual you know that can be intuition it can be synesthesia it could be whatever we don't really harness that we we work in a world where it's like what's well, what you see in front of you and it's what you hear they're the two most important things um you know, but we know that actually, realistically, as human beings, we don't really want to operate like that. So I kind of, I, I wonder if years ago we would have had more people who were synesthetes, maybe? It would be interesting to know, wouldn't it? Certainly when you, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would agree with that. And certainly when you look at the shamanistic cultures, where they talk about how everything has its own spirit, its own animus, mm. then the nature of these spirits tend to be more cross-sensory. Um, and if you look at the cross-section of psychedelic drugs, of, of, of entheogens and um, plant medicines, often they will take you to a situation where the border becomes comes out of the senses. So particularly like um, we talk about it in, in cannabis, but also um, mescaline uh, cactus, LSD, what else? Psy psilocybin, um, so many different ones. Uh, ayahuasca, pe peyote, they all do the same thing that you have this explosion where the senses become a sense, the sensorium, where they, they operate uh, as a cross-reference and like, I read a really interesting study about the people, the shamans of the um, Kalahari Desert and how they sing songs and then see the song lines open up to them so that they can follow where they've got to go for their hunting. Yeah. Um, so that they, they see the song uh, coming up. Well, can't imagine seeing a song, but the whole of their, um, their nation their, um, says, obviously that is what happens that's what we do you know so so that's not just so that's there must be a biological capacity to do that yeah absolutely and also if um if we see that there's this kind of this hereditary element but also a cultural application as well so actually if if you're in um, a small knit community for example let's say then you're going to all have that similar cultural association. So in, in the same way that I um, like, like I see things on um, ladders quite often in my mind, going left to right on a, going up on a scale. So I see numbers like that. So when I take numbers or add numbers or subtract them, I'm going up or down the ladder and taking them. It's a bit complicated to explain, but um, and the same with. Um, the the months of the year but I only do that because culturally we have you know a 12-month calendar yeah if I lived in a different environment many years ago or you know I, I wouldn't know the concept of months so I wouldn't necessarily see that but maybe I would see something else instead so there needs to be this kind of this level of um I suppose culture attached to the hereditary element to then bring those things together really i think as well i mean we, we we talk about us as humans but actually maybe we should be talking about us as westerners because you know in 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 far more remote places this synesthesia is part of their 
everyday existence. But also we have been culturally um, dumbed down in terms of our sense of smell. Yeah. Um, so we don't we haven't explored it from so many different levels. We know less about the sense of smell than any other of our senses. And we talk about five senses, but actually there's far more, you know, sense of balance, sense of beauty, all of those things. So we just kind of channeling it down into, as you say, auditory and, and visual. But also from our point of view as aromatherapists, our language around smell is really quite retarded um you know we we talk about it from a, a point of like a, a vineyard really you know it's wine language that we that we talk about so being able to bring in these extra senses and just and the, and even on the the most basic level i think everybody perceives it to a certain degree you know honing it more brings this richness this development of language around it doesn't it and a, yeah. a, a deeper experience not only for the person smelling the essential oil but also if you've got a client in front of you and you're trying to purvey that scent of that essential oil it gives you so much depth more depth of how to explain it to somebody i think yeah i think that's really important Liz, because i think one of the things that i've noticed when people say to me or um let's say i'm using an oil that i haven't used with them before or it's an oil that I've been researching and I'm just starting to use, you know, because it's it's quite a new oil or something like that. And I say, well, tell me about the oil. So because a few of my clients know that, you know, we, we love talking about oils, right? Because that's our job. <laughs> I say, tell me about the oil. What does it do? How, how why, why are you picking this oil for me now? And that's always really important because that's part of your dialogue with your clients about you don't just choose something, not let them smell it and then use it with them you kind of have that conversation don't you? you you know their likes and their dislikes and you you shape all of that but actually like you say it adds another layer of being able to explain why you're using the oil that you're using and also why you're blending it with the other oils that you're using yeah so one element of um synesthesia is to uh, genderize sometimes yeah. uh, things and also to personify things so um you know that's sort of that um if this were a person it would be you know um so for example i was at a, a conference at the weekend a lot of people were talking about bergamot came up quite a lot um and straight away you heard people saying he so now for somebody else bergamot might be a she doesn't matter but that's just that that gendering of of the oil suddenly you know funnily um, enough to me bergamot is a they there you go you see I, yeah it, it, sit, it sits both sides and yeah. i wouldn't have really thought about that till uh, uh, till you said yeah i yeah. would say that's a definite non-binary or another and i can't think of any others that i would say that about yeah. it's interesting isn't it so i think that no, i think you're right it gives another layer of how we explore that and explain it to ourselves so we can then work with it and appreciate it and understand it and see it in a multi-faceted layer but it also helps us then talk about the oil with other people, whether that's, you know, people you're just talking to about the oil or whether you're actually using it with that person in a, a client aromatherapy kind of relationship. Um, and, and I do think, I mean, we, we're clearly talking about the most subtle of subtleties here, aren't we, you know? But if you, and so you can say, well, isn't this just semantics? And of course, that is semantics, you know, it's about understanding meaning. But if you have... A girl come to you, a teenage girl who is suffering from um, terrible trauma, and she has been abused by men and hates men. What is the how catastrophic might it be to put sandalwood on on her? You know, if if she perceives that oil as a masculine oil, mm. she's not going to relax thinking that she needs to have the safety of a feminine oil. Well, and this also brings up a, a really interesting thing as well, doesn't it, about actually their perception of the oil, you know, your, your client's perception of the oil, because actually, you know, that might be, they may perceive sandalwood as being very masculine, because mm -hmm. for me, tree oils, or oils that come from a tree, um, whether it's bark or resin, or it, it almost always a male, almost yep. always. Um, in fact, I could possibly say are always. Um but yeah, so and I think that's quite common, I think, amongst us. That's probably quite quite a common experience. Um, 
but I guess she might not experience it in that way. But so that's part of that conversation, isn't it? But also, I think if we don't talk about things like synesthesia and our choice of oils and, and aroma in our life, then how do we then match that when a, a client comes in and goes, well, this is how I experience the smell? Because we don't want them to be met with the oh, a bit weird kind of mm-hmm. comment that yep. I got, yep. you know, um, or, or the kind of the feeling that you got, like, can I talk about it? Can I not talk about it? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? How do I perceive it? How do they perceive it? We want to have that kind of that open dialogue. And that helps us understand their experience of the oil, right? So, so I think it's really useful from that point of view because the synesthesia isn't, um, it's, not a con- it's not a condition, it's not a disease, it's not an illness, it's... It's just a trait. It's a human trait that um, that we can all tap into. Some of us have it um, more more uh, than others. Some of us have it more extensively yeah. than others. But I mean, even if you think about, you know, when you see these pictures and they go, what do you see when you look at this picture? And one person sees one thing, one person sees somebody something else. Now, there's lots of theories around why that's the case. You know, when we think about sort of, you know, the ink blots and things that were used in psychoanalysis years ago and all that sort of stuff. But actually, you know, maybe that's, again, just perception. So the brain's linking up and trying to make this this kind of connection, you know, um, because it's seeing one thing. And uh, I watched something the other day and it was really interesting. This guy was saying, well, we kind of, we kind of connect things that we kind of know kind of don't necessarily go together all the time anyway. So I guess that's another way of kind of thinking about it. You know, for synesthetes, it's like this overactivation, if you like. So there isn't that sort of that separation in boxes. You know, this is visual, this is auditory, this is taste. Um, it's kind of more of a, a overarching and a kind of a linking up. But actually, as human beings, we do do that to an element, don't we? Yeah, so, completely. That's the whole that's the whole. Yeah process of, of, of symbols isn't it yeah, you know, that yeah. we make those attachments. absolutely and like you say when it becomes this kind of almost like this metaphor for the oil then actually when you say to your client you know why why have you used that you know or they say um I feel like I need a big you know like a, a big hug from the oils or something like that you know straight away which oils to go to don't you because yeah. of that you know yeah. you know I always say like neroli is like a hug in a bottle you yeah know? And then there's other oils that have similar sort of... Um, Yeti Bear is a great big blanket. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say like blankets. I see blankets very often and kind of, you know, mugs of mugs of hot chocolate and that kind of those images of kind of comfort attached to certain oils. Mm. It's just another layer of, of a way of explaining them. But I think it really helps you appreciate and develop your relationship with that oil and that aroma. I think also when we when we were writing the course content, we missed something actually so we might want to add this in but but it's surface level interesting to to say in this context that we haven't explored in the course the idea of the speed of an oil but you know when but but definitely some are quick some are slow aren't they so how does that make sense you know yeah and i would imagine that everybody perceives those uh, quickening oils those slowing down yeah yeah absolutely because you know if you smell let's say you smell one of the eucalyptuses you know straight away in your body where that goes where does that take you how does that feel everybody goes oh it's into the respiratory system you know they can feel their nostrils flaring they can kind of feel like it's going back into their head yes and really when you think about it is it possible that you can actually feel those molecules at that speed? I don't know whether it is physiologically that they could activate that quick. But you're quite right. You do, don't you? You, yeah. you know yeah, that we really know where they like are. Quick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then you smell something like vetiver and you go like right down. You know, right that down, yeah. So the energy comes down. Yeah. So we feel that kind of that level of, you know, you can say, yeah, what, what is it you're feeling from the oil at that point? But that sensation of, of movement, you know, some oils feel to me very flat and very still. Um, some are very expansive. So it's almost like you can feel and almost see like a ripple going out from you around you. Whereas other oils uh, like Rosalina, for example, is like sparkly and kind of, you know, yeah. there's lots of kind of movement and ethereal kind of element to it. So, but that's a kind of... Um, that's partly that visual and kind of seeing that 
element to it but it's part of the feeling as well you're right it's the feeling isn't it so there is to some extent there is a level of semantics as well but actually I think it's it would be too reductionist to say that it's it's just that it's 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 kind of it's more isn't it it is yeah so like I remember um Rhiannon and Lewis taught, uh, did a, a lecture when we were in um, Budapest. Hard, too many years ago. Thinking about it now, and she and she really moved my consciousness about uh, about oils when she said, "You know, how does it make you feel?" Because I'd always said, "What do you think of that?" And actually, completely the wrong process to be employing. And it yeah. really, it was a, a life changing yeah. moment for me. To how does that make you feel? But actually, maybe now we need to be pulling that a bit further and saying, what does that make you feel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all those questions, isn't it? And I think that's the temptation. You get an oil, you smell it once and you make a snap judgment and then you leave it to one side. But actually, this kind of exploring the layers, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Where do, where, do you taste it? You know, where do you taste it even in your mouth? You know, what does it remind you of? And you're right, the language we have is very um, minimalistic, really. It is, it, yeah. It's very much related, like you say, to wine or to food, isn't it? That's the only kind of um, level of language that we would normally use with our sense of smell. And actually, by talking about it in a way that a synesthete experiences it more, then that opens it up. And I think it gives people permission to go, oh yeah, actually this reminds me of, because this reminds me of is, is part of that experience as well. Well, I think it? as well, you know, our, our businesses have moved on. You and I both came from the same background that we trained in aromatherapy in this country. So we were trained as massage therapists, but but we're not really, I mean, you, you still do a lot of massage, but we do so much online. And so we've got we've got to purvey, uh, convey that information differently to what we did before. You know, that is bottle of oil is not in front of somebody. So telling the story of the oil and the journey that you go on is really important, I think, as, from a sales point of view, as well as a, a therapy point of view. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because then it's it, it becomes alive, doesn't it? Yeah. And I mean, essential oils are part of, you know, they're part of plants, aren't they? So for me that kind of that then brings it full circle really doesn't it because yeah. what we're doing is we're kind of saying we've got this amazing thing from nature we've you know normally distilled but not always you know distilled it down we've got the essential oil and we've got this wonderful sort of essential oil at the end of it but actually yeah let's get back into that cycle and think about where does where does where does that plant where does that plant and that essential oil where do they interact with me and, and that's something wider than just sniffing a bottle and going, that's nice. <laughs> I think the repercussions as well are huge, far bigger than we perceive them. And it was really encapsulated in a, a trial that Jonathan Bienvenides shared on his Facebook the other day. And I was like, well, I've never seen that trial. Um, and it was done with people who had multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. and it was just inhaling lavender and inhaling lavender not only improved their balance but it also stopped their fear of falling yeah so yeah. what was happening there because that's not just reducing somebody's smell that's clearly acting on a sense of balance isn't it yeah 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 and and and, man and managing that fear as well managing yeah. that level of fear and, and anxiety that would go with that and we know that's really common that if people have had a fall once, the fear of falling will continue. So, yeah, yeah it's it's yeah. Yeah. And like you say, there's so many more senses, aren't there? We're very much taught. We're, we're taught at school, aren't we? We do all those lovely diagrams and we're taught how to taste things in your mouth at the front of your mouth or the back of your mouth and which part yeah, of the tongue was yeah, yeah, yeah. do you remember doing those yeah. experiments at school, and actually you know? there's more now isn't there so we talk, so yeah. if you like if you like watching like heston blumenthal or something it always talks about umami smells a uh, 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 taste so like the taste of mushrooms and kind of a, like a, a, a kind of earthy taste well we never learned about that sense of uh, taste no. at school that's no. a whole new experience that's been brought, brought in 
And now I'll know what you mean by that word because I've never heard that before. <laughs> it's like, so I imagine it to be like a bit like soy sauce, that kind of okay. strange, earthy, salty okay. kind of blah, I think, taste. You know, <laughs> I don't understand why anyone would want to cook just to achieve that. But 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 yeah, yeah. We yeah. always used to call it wesh when we were kids. It's a wesh taste. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But again, it's expanding, isn't it, on that language, on how we... Yeah we talk about something you you talking about it being able to explain it and I'm seeing an image of what that might or might not look like and it helps doesn't it all helps yeah yeah and and and, and interestingly it would have a different effect on somebody who didn't like mushrooms to someone who did you know even yeah. just talking about it, it yeah. takes you to that place doesn't yeah. It? yeah 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 and again very culturally specific because if you live somewhere where you don't eat mushrooms wouldn't have a, a clue necessarily what we were talking about so yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and my daughter really hates mushrooms but it's nothing to do with the taste it's the texture you know right. it's too yeah. slimy so again yeah. we're going on this this oh i won't eat it because i don't like the texture so yeah. that's always how you experience it in your mouth oh it's a different thing yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely and and also how difficult is that then for somebody who has synesthesia who then tastes things you know they 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 taste um a, a name or or a letter or a word and how difficult for, for them might that be then if actually you're bombarded by stuff that doesn't taste good because you've got no yeah. control over yeah. that have you no. i mean that's that's the thing it's involuntary isn't it we, well, we i mean we... that's been a massive less, lesson in covid isn't it those people yeah. who've lost their sense of taste mm -hmm. you know it's led to profound depression for people yeah yeah, absolutely. And there's study after study that shows you lose your sense of smell and you lose your sense of taste and there's increased incidence of depression. Mm -hmm. And that's really, you know, that's really sad. So it's, um, yeah, we, we don't we don't appreciate it enough. And um, yeah, I think we need to talk more about how how our senses are can be linked for some people and how how we can embrace that and enjoy it and how we can also manage it as well. Yeah. So let's talk about the workshop then for a yeah. second which bit are you most looking forward to doing I know what mine is um so I'm most looking forward to uh people working with an oil that they're not familiar with yes because I, I kind of want to bust this idea that you uh, I know I do this I get an oil out the post and I go like this and I go oh let's just have a good sniff and I don't do like I'd, I'd like to say do sniffy sticks and stuff. And, and do you do the smelling uh, before you read the book? Uh, I try to smell before I read the book, but if I get oils through the post, I literally I'm just like unwrap them like this, and then I'm Broke. yeah. <laughs> and I'd like to say I don't do that, you know. And then I go back and work with it. And obviously, I do, you know. I put some on a smelling strip, put it normally on a piece of tissue actually, and just have it in front of me while I'm kind of working with it. So I do do that, but. Um, I can't stop myself going and just cracking them open and having a sniff. But that's the issue, isn't it? That actually, um, then how do you describe what you're smelling? Yeah, and, and so it's going to be in really interesting giving people architecture, just like simple questions yeah. of what does what does that feel like? Yeah. What does yeah. who does that feel like? You know, yeah. all of those simple questions that take their mind in different directions yeah. to explore it. And I do think we can train ourselves to do that more and more and more. And I think it's you know it's like meditation, right? You, you meditate, you first start trying to meditate, and you go, oh, can't do it. Too much in my head. Too much in my head. And you stop. And you do like ten seconds, twenty seconds if you're lucky, thirty seconds. Some people can do a bit more, but most people's introduction to meditation is that they struggle at the beginning a lot. And then the time increases and the time increases and the time increases. And then, you know, somebody um, who, who I know who does meditation three times a day, and she said, you know, I can do three half hour sections a day now if I want to. Well, I can't do three I half go. hours. Struggle with half Stop an thinking. hour, to be honest. Stop thinking. Stop thinking. You're thinking about thinking. Stop thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then all these things yeah. come in. And so this, and and so for me, working this way with 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 uh, essential oils of having that kind of architecture of having yeah. something for the brain to concentrate on really helps me. I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then that's where you can then explore. You know, like you say, what does it feel like? How does it smell? So that's for me. Um, that's kind of probably the most exciting thing. And I think anybody can do that. It doesn't matter if you've just got a few oils and you use them for yourself at home, 
or if you've been practicing as an aroma therapist for 30 years you know it's something that we can all as human beings do when we approach smell we can think you know what does that feel like where does it sit with me where does it go in my body what's the movement what's the shape of that you know um, yeah i mean the, the shamans of peru call it the yoshi and everything from the uh, from the plants in the, uh, uh, around them to the transistor radio have got a yoshi you know and so they've all got this spirit and and this idea of well, because that you can't really have an ally. You can't really use a plant as an ally unless you understand who that ally is, do you? Yeah. You know, and so we all talk about these plant spirits. And I think there's like a tendency to think, oh, like it's this ethereal being that's all green and it comes out of the trees. Well, maybe it does, but maybe it's just square, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? And only you will know that, you know, only you can connect on that level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so the part I'm most interested in doing is going to be the tactile nature of how does do these different oils feel? You know, is it kind of velvety? Is it silky? Does it feel jagged? I don't really explore that as a natural thing, so I'm really looking forward to doing that. Yeah. Actually, tell a lie as well. I'm really looking forward to um, hearing you talk about music. Yeah, so... That's something that in my head I don't understand. You don't get it at all. Not part no, of my I mean, I've said this to you, and I'm sure that people have seen it in my books, but in case they haven't. So back in to 1993, um, in the days before Mars bars, and I was going to say before children, but no, but I think Amy was about one when I did it, maybe two. Um, I used to sing in a, um, a choir, I was a good singer, and we did a concert of Haydn's creation. Um, and I did all these amazing blends and we put them into candles, into these floral decorations and filled the church with this essential oil blend. So, yeah, so it'll be lovely to go back to that again and to rework that information again. Um, I've just been able to sort of point you to well, what oil can you hear in that? And, when, and I think that a lot of people will go, that was really easy. Yes, it is really easy. It's nothing special, but it's yeah. just having that door opened isn't it yeah absolutely and I think again this whole thing about you know people thinking synesthesia is quite unusual and it's it's not so unusual and like we, we've said before you know that we all have elements of it and we can kind of work on it some more to expand our own sort of um, understanding around that but you know 50% of the population if you ask them if they hear a low note they'll experience that as a darker colour mm. and a light note which uh, higher notes rather which they'll experience as a lighter color so you know if 50 percent of the population are doing that then actually we've all got that in there somewhere haven't we to yeah and, i mean we, we we hear it on films and stuff don't we we're conditioned duh, duh, duh. yeah you know, it's like that that malevolent malevolent is never like up there twinkly is it it's yeah, like, yeah 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 so we're getting a little bit of cultural conditioning Yes, oh, and that and and conditioning, but maybe training. You yes, know? yeah, yeah. But so, so just one more thing, I think, to to say to people is that this is a workshop that we're going to do rather than a lecture. So yeah. we really want people to bring their own oils and to bring an open mind. And there's no right and wrong answers at all. Yeah, absolutely, and maybe bring pencils and coloring pens and paper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I mean, happen. that's to me, oh, that would never occur to me at all. And to, me, to you, it was obvious. But so, Whereas yeah. I'd be going, no, no, get the, get the pens out, get the pens out. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Get the blank paper. Have well, it next to you while we're working. Yes. <laughs> I am so looking forward to doing it, Hal. Really absolutely, am. Absolutely. So thanks so much for, for doing this with me today. And uh, I hope it makes things clearer for people and that they want to come and do it with us. So, yeah, we you'll you'll... I don't think you'll learn lots. I think you will really just widen your awareness. And I think that we can all benefit for that, can't we? Absolutely. See you soon.